you guys know me, I am not adverse to going back in, making changes, and doing course updates, and giving you a little bonus every now and then. And I have definitely been following what's going on with the Grand Chess Tour. And I gotta say, I like what I'm seeing. And I have a couple of these videos pop up on a few of my courses in the discussion board, if you're interested. We got a sale going on. And you can get that big discount on Master of the French Defense for the next couple of days. And then, uh, shh, if you're interested in the Alakine, a couple of days following that, it's going to be on mass sale as well. But without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about the game that we have in front of us between MVL and the potential future boss, Nepo. He, in fact, is one of the few at the top level that is essaying the French on a semi-regular basis. And this particular line that he used in this game, I already had a little bullet point in my notes for the future on course updates on something I was really wanting to add. I like this line a lot. So let's go ahead and take a look at it and why I like it so much. So we get ourselves this most aggressive setup for white. And we have a number of different options in the course covered already. And I've in fact gotten a complaint lately. Like, starting to become too many options, Brian. I'm sorry, guys. There's going to be more, and I'm going to go back in at some point and fine-tooth comb everything, add more annotations. I'll probably just re-record the entire video course, because why not? I just... I like doing this. <laughs> I can't help myself. After bishop g5, we have some options here. If bishop e7, e5, knight fd7, this h4 move, it's what I'm teaching all of my students when they're playing white in these positions. Well, against the French in particular. It's aggressive, it's nasty. Black gets a playable position, but if you slip here at all with black, if you don't know the theory, you could lose very quickly. So, this, this dissuades some French players, if you will. And then coming back to this position, we got the McCutcheon. That's been the most recent major course update. And some players, this isn't their cup of tea because we're giving up our good bishop early. I can appreciate that. So, coming back, we do have a Rubenstein chapter, but it's not quite in the flavor of the Rubenstein. This, this is getting definitely a more aggressive game, but we're, we're avoiding this H4 gambit line that's so dirty. And we get this nice position, bishop e7, where we're already putting the question to the knight on e4. And an exchange typically is going to happen on f6. Whereas, sideline, if knight takes up six. I always like to see where even though we have our typical French bad B, very easy to fix in this position, we already have one piece developed where white has none. I feel good already about our chances with this sideline. So coming back to the main line and what was played in the game, bishop takes f6. We get this dynamic capture with g takes f6. We have the bishop pair for the long term for these doubled pawns, and I already just have this deep love for the bishop pair, and feel good about this. So let's continue on. Knight f3, f5, putting the question of that knight on e4, and after knight c3, an important move, a6, and we're following the main line so far, getting control of that critical b5 square, may be able to play b5 ourselves at some point, giving a nice square for our problem French bishop to develop to on b7, and he is a problem no more once he reaches there. g3, there's our b5, and after bishop g2, bishop b7, and I really, really like this next move by the challenger for the world championship. The typical move that we see in the database is castles. And we have this long sequence of trades here. 
B4, check, takes, rook D8. And this is the main line, and it's, it's roughly equal. Definitely a playable position. No problem with it, but if you're wanting to keep tension in the position, you want to try to outplay your opponents, bishop f6. A relatively rare move, but, uh, I mean, if he's facing Magnus, he's got to be doing something right. Bishop f6. So let's explore a little. Well, if white tries to go with the same thematic move that we saw on the main line after castles with knight e5, after takes, takes c5, black already has an edge. And it's easy to confuse lines, especially if you're not actively studying a particular line. I could see how white could make a mistake like that. Well, after bishop f6, rook e1 was played in the game. And though this position is very solid, white just never really seems to get anything going in this game. Objectively, the game should be a draw, but when you press, 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 sometimes you can be a little sneaky and get the win anyway. So let's go through this 70-move game, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. After castles, white's trying to reorganize pieces. We find ourselves fully developed. The bishop pair is working. Capture, capture. Making sure that isolated pawn isn't going to be pushed to d5 further crippling our structure after knight h5 we have no better than to give up the b in this situation and this quaint little rook lift is nice because the rook will have the ability to swing over to either the c7 or d7 critical square because undoubtedly at some point white's going to play this knight e5 move after capture capture rook c7, and that quaint little rook lift already gives us a leg up on white in controlling the only open file in the position. So we've got the double, and white's doing what he can to fight over the only open c file. Very logical. Now, just to make sure we're covering key squares around our king and don't get into trouble, f6, get that knight out of there, takes, takes, and... For the double pawn, we're playing against this isolated pawn. So again, still roughly equal, but chances to press some. And this game definitely goes the distance. The ladies come off the board. The kings are safe. So what is it about a knight ending? It's just a king and pawn endgame with knights. <laughs> I always love when I would read that in an in-game text. E4. And both B pawns are being attacked. So we trade a set. And compare the kings. Black's king has just a little bit more to work with. Because our knight is well placed in conjunction with the pawn. Controlling key squares and making a wall. Keeping that white king out. After check... Got to control those base pawns. Notice our king is making sure to handle this one and our knight is handling this one. So we got to figure out a way to create some sort of pressure and make progress. A4, a little bit closer to the promised land, that A1 square. King D1, and now it's a good time if you're playing the home game trying to figure this, the moves out as I'm going. What would you do here with black in order to try to make progress? All right, hopefully you're a pause your video and figure it out type of guy. And did you find the move that the challenger found? F4. We need that path for the king to get to the base pawns. And after takes, king F5. Our king is a little bit closer. We've traded another pawn. And after knight D4, H5. And slow and steady. So once told within games, if you can do it in 10 moves or do it in one move for the idea, you want to do it in 10 moves. I think mostly this is a psychological thing for our opponents, and I know that this is a blitz game. Maybe time is a factor here at this point that if you can work your opponent, if you're on the better side of equality, you should take the option to do so. 
because sometimes that water torture that's going on, people will have a knee-jerk reaction trying to force a change that they didn't need to to get rid of that pressure, and they end up losing the game because of it. So keep that type of in-game principle in mind. Knight e6 check, king e5, and the pawns just get getting closer and closer to where they need to be. Excellent technique. And white's still not in serious trouble yet, but especially in a blitz game. I can, I can see how you wouldn't find all critical resources to be able to hold this. Now, same plan, I just need to get to a base pawn. So black rushes the king. Now, we also have to worry about the fact that white could very easily get to a base pawn. So we're both watching critical squares. And after knight b5, when watching this game, I thought for sure that this was going to be a draw. But then a little bit of a dance goes on. And my favorite move of the game is coming up. I'm, I'm getting excited. <laughs> and right here, knight g4. It's always nice to just say, take, take my knight. Such a, such a sneaky move, and it shows the will to win that even though the position is 0, 0.00 for the longest time, and it even is here still. If white plays king d4, here's a pretty straightforward drawing line, for instance, knight f2, check, so we couldn't go after the pawn, and then we have this situation where black is stalemating himself, sadly. Well, after knight g4, king f4 was played, and this allows the knight to go after the base pawn. And we go from the entire game to black wins. Quick transition where the knight is able to conveniently get back over. And Nepo takes the full point with this line which will eventually be in addition in the French course. As always, thank you guys so much for your support on Chessable. It's, it's always nice to, to pop in. You get great questions. The book gets better and better. I blame you guys for the book and <laughs> it getting better over time. I get motivated as you guys are studying, getting motivated. And please, always, share your wins. Definitely do it in the comments. Let me know. I love seeing the games. Thanks.